a baker from Goa. Our elders are often heard reminiscing nostalgically about those good old Portuguese days, the Portuguese and their famous loaves of bread. Those eaters of loaves might have vanished, but the makers are still there. We still have amongst us the mixers, the molders, and those who bake the loaves. Those age-old, time-tested furnaces still exist. The fire in the furnaces has not yet been extinguished. The thud and jingle of the traditional baker's bamboo, heralding his arrival in the morning, can still be heard in some places. Maybe the father is not alive, but the son still carries on the family profession. These bakers are, even today, known as Pater and Goa. During our childhood in Goa, the baker used to be our friend, companion, and guide. He used to come at least twice a day. Once when he set out in the morning on his selling round, and then again when he returned after emptying his huge basket. The jingling thud of his bamboo woke us up from sleep and we ran to meet and greet him. Why was it so? Was it for the love of the loaf? Not at all. The loaves were bought by some paskine or bastine, the maid servant of the house. What we longed for were those bread bangles which we chose carefully. Sometimes it was sweet bread of special make. The baker made his musical entry on the scene with the jang, jang sound of his specially made bamboo staff. One hand supported the basket on his head and the other banged the bamboo on the ground. He would greet the lady of the house with good morning and then place his basket on the vertical bamboo. We kids would be pushed aside with a mild rebuke and the loaves would be delivered to the servant. But we would not give up. We would climb a bench or the parapet and peep into the basket somehow. I can still recall the typical fragrance of those loaves. Loaves for the elders and the bangles for the children. Then we did not even care to brush our teeth or wash our mouths properly. And why should we? Who would take the trouble of plucking the mango leaf for the toothbrush? And why was it necessary at all? The tiger never brushed his teeth. Hot tea could wash and clean up everything so nicely, after all. Marriage gifts are meaningless without the sweet bread known as the bowl, just as a party or a feast loses its charm without bread. Not enough can be said to show how important a baker can be for a village. The lady of the house must prepare sandwiches on the occasion of her daughter's engagement. Cakes and bolinhas are a must for Christmas as well as other festivals. Thus, the presence of the baker's furnace in the village is absolutely essential. The baker or bread seller of those days had a peculiar dress known as the kabai. It was a single piece long for reaching down to the knees. In our childhood, we saw bakers wearing a shirt and trousers which were shorter than full-length ones and longer than half pants. Even today, anyone who wears a half pant which reaches just below the knees invites the comment that he is dressed like a patter. The baker usually collected his bills at the end of the month. Monthly accounts used to be recorded on some wall in pencil. Baking was indeed a profitable profession in the old days. The baker and his family never starved. He, his family, and his servants always looked happy and prosperous. Their plump physique was an open testimony to this. Even today, any person with a jackfruit-like physical appearance is easily compared to a baker. Korg Midway between Mysore and the coastal town of Mangalore sits a piece of heaven that must have drifted from the kingdom of God. This land of rolling hills is inhabited by a proud race of martial men, beautiful women, and wild creatures. Korg, or Kodagu, the smallest district of Karnataka, is home to evergreen rainforests, spices, and coffee plantations. Evergreen rainforests cover 30% of this district. During the monsoons, it pours enough to keep many visitors away. The season of joy commences from September and continues till March. The weather is perfect, with some showers thrown in for good measure. The air breathes of invigorating coffee. Coffee estates and colonial bungalows stand tucked under tree canopies in prime corners. The fiercely independent people of Korg are possibly of Greek or Arabic descent. As one story goes, a part of Alexander's army moved south along the coast and settled here when return became impractical. These people married amongst the locals and their culture is apparent in the martial traditions, marriage and religious rites which are distinct from the Hindu mainstream. The theory of Arab origin draws support from the long, black coat with an embroidered waist belt worn by the Kodavis. Known as Kupia, it resembles the Kufia worn by the Arabs and the Kurds. Corgi homes have a tradition of hospitality, and they are more than willing to recount numerous tales of valor related to their sons and fathers. The Korg regiment is one of the most decorated in the Indian army, and the first chief of the Indian army, General Karyapa, was a corgi. Even now, 
Kodavas are the only people in India permitted to carry firearms without a license. The river, Kaveri, obtains its water from the hills and forests of Korg. Mahasir, a large freshwater fish, abound in these waters. Kingfishers dive for their catch, while squirrels and lungurs drop partially eaten fruit for the mischief of enjoying the splash and the ripple effect in the clear water. Elephants enjoy being bathed and scrubbed in the river by their mahouts. The most laid-back individuals become converts to the life of high-energy adventure with river rafting, canoeing, rappelling, rock climbing, and mountain biking. Numerous walking trails in this region are a favorite with trekkers. Birds, bees, and butterflies are there to give you company. Macaques, Malabar squirrels, Lungurs and slender loris keep a watchful eye from the tree canopy. I do, however, prefer to step aside for wild elephants. The climb to the Brahmagiri Hills brings you into a panoramic view of the entire misty landscape of Korg. A walk across the rope bridge leads to the 64-acre island of Nisargadama. Running into Buddhist monks from India's largest Tibetan settlement at nearby Bailakup is a bonus. The monks, in red, ochre, and yellow robes, are amongst the many surprises that wait to be discovered by visitors searching for the heart and soul of India, right here in Korg. T from Assam. Pranjal, a youngster from Assam, is Rajver's classmate at school in Delhi. Pranjal's father is the manager of a tea garden in Upper Assam and Pranjal has invited Rajver to visit his home during the summer vacation. See Chai Garam. Garam Chai, a vendor called out in a high-pitched voice. He came up to their window and asked, Chai, Esayab, give us two cups, Pranjal said. They sipped the steaming hot liquid. Almost everyone in their compartment was drinking tea too. Do you know that over 80 crore cups of tea are drunk every day throughout the world? Rajver said. Phew, exclaimed Pranjal. Tea really is very popular. The train pulled out of the station. Pranjal buried his nose in his detective book again. Rajver too was an ardent fan of detective stories but at the moment he was keener on looking at the beautiful scenery. It was green, green everywhere. Rajver had never seen so much greenery before. Then the soft green paddy fields gave way to tea bushes. It was a magnificent view. Against the backdrop of densely wooded hills a sea of tea bushes stretched as far as the eye could see. Dwarfing the tiny tea plants were tall sturdy shade trees and amidst the orderly rows of bushes busily moved doll-like figures. In the distance was an ugly building with smoke billowing out of tall chimneys. Hey, a tea garden. Rajver cried excitedly. Pranjal, who had been born and brought up on a plantation, didn't share Rajver's excitement. Oh, this is tea country now, he said. Assam has the largest concentration of plantations in the world. You will see enough gardens to last you a lifetime. I have been reading as much as I could about tea, Rajver said. No one really knows who discovered tea, but there are many legends. What legends? Well, there's the one about the Chinese emperor who always boiled water before drinking it. One day a few leaves of the twigs burning under the pot fell into the water, giving it a delicious flavor. It is said they were tea leaves. Tell me another, scoffed Pranjal. We have an Indian legend too. Bodhidharma, an ancient Buddhist ascetic, cut off his eyelids because he felt sleepy during meditations. Ten tea plants grew out of the eyelids. The leaves of these plants when put in hot water and drunk banished sleep. He was first drunk in China, Rajver added, as far back as 2700 BC. In fact, words such as tea, chai, and chini are from Chinese. Tea came to Europe only in the 16th century and was drunk more as medicine than as beverage. The train clattered into Mariani Junction. The boys collected their luggage and pushed their way to the crowded platform. Pranjal's parents were waiting for them. Soon they were driving towards Dikiabari, the tea garden managed by Pranjal's father. An hour later the car veered sharply off the main road. They crossed a cattle bridge and entered Dikiabari Tea Estate. On both sides of the gravel road were acre upon acre of tea bushes, all neatly pruned to the same height. Groups of tea pluckers, with bamboo baskets on their backs, wearing plastic aprons, were plucking the newly sprouted leaves. Pranjal's father slowed down to allow a tractor, pulling a trailer load of tea leaves, to pass. This is the second flush, or sprouting period, isn't it, Mr. Barua? Rajver asked. It lasts from May to July and yields the best tea. You seem to have done your homework before coming, Pranjal's father said in surprise. Yes, Mr. Barua, Rajver admitted. But I hope to learn much more while I'm here.